Hi everyone, I'm going to go through the little audio lecture for your study guide. And this would be for lecture exam 3, the respiratory system and the urinary system. So for the respiratory system, we have number 1, which it says describe the structures of the respiratory system and the special features that characterize the airways. Keep in mind the air enters either through the nose or the mouth. Um, the nose actually is good for filtering air, warming it, humidifying it. Um, and it, uh, the, um, But the mouth is another way to take in air, obviously, but you are, don't have the warming and filtering benefits that breathing through the nose provides. Um, air then enters the pharynx, which is the space within the mouth and the back of the throat. Um, and that's common to your gastrointestinal tract and the airways. So, but air then will go first past the larynx, L-A-R-Y-N-X, then into the trachea. Um, both the larynx and the trachea have cartilage uh, reinforcement. So the larynx has plates of cartilage, which gives it structure and firmness. The trachea has cartilage rings. And these rings will give the trachea strength so that if you have a forceful exhalation, your trachea will not collapse. So that's a good thing. Um, as the uh, air goes through the trachea, then goes to the um, bronchi. And actually, this is illustrated in number three. You will need to know the route through which air goes. Um, but when air enters the smaller airways, there's less and less cartilage because these actually have a lot of smooth muscle. Uh, the little bronchioles, um, they actually, they're the smaller uh, airways and they will dilate to open up and they can constrict and get smaller due to the smooth muscle in there. Uh, linings. In the trachea, the, remember the mucosa closest to the lumen, that mucosa is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And that actually has these ciliated cells and between them there are interspersed goblet cells that make mucus so that any kind of debris, dust, bacteria um, if it enters the trachea, it will be trapped in the mucus, and then the cilia actually beat upwards toward the pharynx so that you can uh, keep that uh, material out of the lungs. Okay, number two. This is one where you might need to um, actually write this, um, the definitions of these three phases of respiration um, in, in a short answer format. So there's External respiration. This happens at the site of the alveoli, between the blood and the alveoli. So with the blood, remember the blood going to the lungs that's in these little capillaries around the alveoli is low in oxygen and high in carbon dioxide. The air that you're breathing in, hopefully, is higher in oxygen than, than is oxygen in the blood. So oxygen diffuses from the air and the alveoli into the blood. That is, that is external respiration. Remember, respiration is a cellular process. Then we have internal respiration. Internal respiration is the exchange of gases at the site of the tissues, where the oxygen goes from the blood into the body cells, and then the body cells, metabolizing cells, are getting rid of the carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide comes out from the cells, the tissues, into the bloodstream. The third phase of respiration is cellular respiration. And we call it aerobic cellular respiration because that is when oxygen is used in order to break down glucose for energy and this is represented in that diagram that you need to draw up on the aerobic uh, respiration. So the oxygen is used in the breakdown of glucose, and then that will produce carbon dioxide and water, which will exit the cell. Okay, trace the flow of inhaled air. Um, by the way, I gave you the slide number for this, slide number 11, chapter 22, part B. Number three, trace the flow of inhaled air. Naming all the structures that it passes, 
um, until it arrives in the alveoli. Uh, be sure to include these, but start out, you should know from the pharynx, it goes to the larynx, then the trachea, then primary bronchi to secondary bronchi. Then each of these becomes smaller and there's actually more of them. Um, in other words, the, from one trachea, you get two primary bronchi, one to each lung, and then these branch into secondary bronchi, to different lobes of the lung. Then you've got tertiary bronchi, this means third level, to ter and then to bronchioles, it goes to terminal bronchioles, and then respiratory bronchioles. Respiratory bronchioles lead to the alveolar ducts and sacs. And again, it's right in slide 43 to 46 in chapter 22, part A. Four and five here go together, and this is um, to describe how gas exchange occurs between the alveolar membrane in the lungs and the associated blood capillaries. Uh, the hint is actually the answer. This is due to diffusion um, simple diffusion, but it's driven by concentration gradient or partial pressure gradient. I kind of think they're not quite the same, but when you have a higher concentration of some solute particle, it's always going to go down its uh, concentration gradient from high concentration to low. And it's very similar with pressure gradient, so it goes from a higher pressure gradient to low. This ties in here with number five, and I gave kind of an extended note right here. Let me move it down a little bit. Um, to distinguish between partial pressure of O2 and CO2 in the blood capillaries, in the lungs, and the atmospheric air. Now, keep in mind, atmospheric air at sea level is 78% nitrogen gas, which is inert. Nitrogen just takes up space. We don't... Uh, it doesn't enter the bloodstream. It shouldn't, anyway. Um, then you have 21% oxygen gas and less than 1% carbon dioxide. This varies with altitude, but um, when you breathe in atmospheric air, it's going to mix with that air that just can't get out of your lungs, um, otherwise your lungs would collapse. So the amount of oxygen gas, whether you think of it as concentration, a percentage or partial pressure. It's going to be slightly lower, but the oxygen in the air will be higher than the oxygen in the blood that's coming back to the lungs. That blood coming back to the lungs is relatively high in carbon dioxide compared to the carbon dioxide in the air in the alveoli. So um, these gases are going to travel uh, due to differences in partial pressure. And if you want to think of that as concentration gradients, that might help you visualize. There are two individuals honored here. Um, Dr. Dalton uh, was famous for stating that when you have a mixture of gases, each gas contributes to the total pressure. Henry, Dr. Henry, said that um, a gas over a liquid will flow into the liquid until the pressure is equal. Um, both carbon dioxide and oxygen can enter or dissolve in the blood. Um, they have different uh, their different abilities to dissolve more. CO2 dissolves a lot more readily than oxygen, but oxygen is going to be picked up by hemoglobin. This is described in slides 12 and 13, chapter 22, part B. So, moving on. Inspiration is also called inhalation. Expiration is exhalation. Inspiration is active. It takes muscle, uh, it takes energy, excuse me, and it is muscular. The main muscle is the diaphragm, and then you have the other uh, accessory muscles of, uh, for breathing. And inhalation is a contraction of those muscles to literally suck the air in from the atmosphere. And then expiration or exhalation is passive. It's when you release the air, the muscles relax, and the lungs will go back to their original size. There's a lot of elasticity of the lungs, so that it's, a, it's called recoil, where they go back to the uninflated um, size. And that is the air exits except for any air that has to stay behind 
to prevent your lungs from collapsing. Seven, under, understand how hydrogen ion concentration is related to carbon dioxide concentration in the blood. This is why we did that little activity at the end of lab, not at the end of the lab, but it was the second part in the uh, respiratory physiology lab that I passed out during lab. CO2 in water will produce an acid. Increasing carbon dioxide levels increases hydrogen ion concentration in the blood. And again, this ties in with this objective. The formulas are given to you in that lab that I distributed. Um, CO2 plus H2O will produce H2CO3, carbonic acid, and it's an acid because it will immediately dissociate or come apart into hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion. Bicarbonate is HC, excuse me, yeah, HCO3 minus. So when we have hydrogen ion in the blood or added to any liquid, that makes it more acidic. Okay, and again, the homeostasis of the blood is also one of the functions of the respiratory system because the respiratory um, rate and depth will determine how much carbon dioxide is exhaled. So if you are breathing rapidly and deeply, you're actually eliminating more carbon dioxide and getting rid of hydrogen ion because the, the carbon dioxide in the blood is now carbonic acid at the level of the alveoli, it will actually come out of solution. And when you breathe out the carbon dioxide, it will bring the pH of the blood up from a, a, you know, a, an acidic pH up within the normal range of blood pH, which is quite narrow, 7.35 to 7.45. So um, if you actually are suffering from uh, too much alkaline in the body, for example, if a person is vomiting for a long time, they're losing hydrogen ion, the lungs can compensate um, by uh, uh, just having more shallow and infrequent respirations to actually retain CO2 that actually keeps the blood from becoming too alkaline. Um, so the, the lungs will react right away to acidity or alkalinity of the blood. Long term, the kidneys will be able to excrete excess hydrogen ion and they can also excrete bicarbonate ion if the blood is becoming too basic. So, um, under, number 10 is just a few definitions. Understand the definitions of apnea. This is lack of breathing. When you stop breathing, that's apnea. Dyspnea is difficulty breathing. Cyanosis is that dusky, bluish color. Um, you may have seen this if somebody gets really cold and the, um, around the lips, it's called circumoral cyanosis, because when you're cold, remember the superficial um, blood vessels will clamp down, it will constrict in order to keep the, um, the core body temperature higher to warm the body up. This also um, occurs like if somebody is, if it's cold outside, um, if your hand, it'll actually clamp down, the blood vessels clamp down to the extremity as well, like fingers or toes. Um, also, if somebody's having a hard time breathing or there's um, something wrong with the circulatory system where they're not getting enough blood um, to the fingers, for example, you might see some uh, dusky or bluish color on the fingernails, uh, under the fingernails. <laughs> Hypoxia is low blood oxygen. And the oxygen, oxygen level of blood is too low. Carbon monoxide is just a little comment here. Carbon monoxide binds with hemoglobin 200 times more readily than oxygen gas. So you could be in a room with plenty of oxygen, but if there is high level of carbon monoxide that's released from uh, you know, stoves, furnace, or actually exhaust from the, um, in the, car, from the car in a garage, um, that carbon monoxide will bind your hemoglobin so that it prevents oxygen from binding. And that's why it's very dangerous and you can die from exposure to high levels of carbon monoxide. 
you do need to know these volumes and you need to be able to define them. There is a table and also a, a graph in um, chapter 22 and I want you to know the definitions of tidal volume, be able to describe what this is. Remember, it's just the volume of air in and out at rest. Expiratory reserve volume is that volume of air that you can breathe over and above tidal volume into your lung. Oh, excuse me, expiratory reserve. Um, inspiratory reserve is that volume of air that you can breathe in over and above tidal volume. And expiratory reserve volume is the volume of air that after you're finished with a normal exhale, you can push out um, of the lungs. And all three of these together, tidal volume, expiratory reserve volume, and inspiratory reserve volume, make what we call a vital capacity. So it's when you take that deep breath and fully exhale, as we did with the spirometers. Um, that is called vital capacity. Residual volume is the volume of air in your lungs that you cannot exhale, otherwise your lungs would collapse. Then you have total lung capacity, and that would include all of the volumes um, tidal volume, expiratory reserve volume, inspiratory reserve volume, and residual volume. Or you could just say, for total lung capacity, vital capacity plus residual volume. So look at those tables and know how to describe those. Okay, and then you have your diagram that you're going to draw up, and you will not get a, um, you know, fill in the blank. It, you'll just draw it freehand on a blank piece of paper. There's an extra page at the back of the test. You can draw it there. Or if you want to come in before class, you can draw it up um, in my office. I'll be there before class. Urinary system, all right. Structures of the urinary system and the functions of each. You have your kidneys. That's the main star, and that's what everything else that we talk about with uh, the functioning of the urinary system is going to be about the kidneys. The ureters are the tubes that carry urine from the kidneys to the urinary bladder. Urinary bladder is a muscular sac that can store urine for a while until it, you need to uh, ex, you know, limit, void or get rid of the, um, it's called micturate actually, to go to the bathroom uh, in a polite area. And then the urethra is the tube that goes from the urinary bladder out to the outside of the body, carries urine out. Um, the structures, um, and in, so describe or draw the structures. You don't need to draw them, but be able to describe and know the structures, the parts of a nephron. The juxtamedullary nephron is the one that's just closer down into the medulla that is a big, long loop of the nephron. So we start out, remember at the where the glomerulus, which is a little blood vessel, it's surrounded with a glomerular capsule. The glomerular capsule is actually the beginning of a nephron. Remember, there's millions uh, in your body, mil over a million per kidney. Glomerular capsule surrounds the glomerulus. Uh, the whole, that whole unit is called Bowman's, no, it's actually called, uh, excuse me, the um, renal corpuscle. But anyway, keep in mind the nephron is actually starts with a capsule into which blood is uh, blood is filtered there. So all the water solutes will come out from the blood into these little glomerular capsules. Then we go to proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of the nephron. There, the loop goes down and then back up again. The one, the part that goes down is called the descending limb. The part that goes back up is ascending limb. Then that leads to the distal convoluted tubule, and then the that's going to bring the filtrate to a collecting duct. So uh, you've got the glomerular capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, loop of the nephron, and then distal convoluted tubule. Okay. Um, oh, the associated circulatory elements around the... Um, proximal convoluted tubule and distal convoluted tubule, you have peritubular capillaries, and they just circle all around these tubules. Um, around the juxtamedullary nephron's um, loop, it actually is a blood, it's a peritubular, in other words, it's blood vessels around the tubule, and it's specifically called, um, 
called the vasa recta because it's kind of straight. It doesn't, it's not all curly like the uh, peritubular um, capillaries. But anyway, all of these blood vessels circle around and are very closely associated with the nephron tubules. Okay, filtration, tubular reabsorption, tubular secretion. You really need to know these three processes, and that's how the kidneys or the nephrons, keep in mind it's all about the nephrons, and there's millions of these per kidney. Uh, filtration happens, uh, and this is actually like the answer down here. Filtration occurs at the glomerulus, the glomeri into the glomerular capsule, period. That's where filtration occurs. It doesn't occur anywhere else. Peritubular reabsorption, this occurs primarily at the proximal convoluted tubule, um, the loop of the Henle, and also at the distal convoluted tubule, and actually it also occurs um, at the site of the um, collecting tubule or collecting duct. This is when material from the filtrate within the tubule will go from the filtrate back into the bloodstream, into the blood in these capillaries that are surrounding the tubules. Tubular reabsorption. Once reabsorption means it goes out from the filtrate into the little interstitial um, fluid of the kidneys, but then back into the bloodstream. Um, Tubular secretion, this is the opposite of tubular reabsorption. This is this occurs primarily at the distal convoluted tubule in the collecting duct. And this is when things in the bloodstream that are still in the bloodstream in those peritubular capillaries, it can be detected by the body if there's still high levels of toxins, or blood metab uh, or drug metabolites, potassium, things that could be dangerous if they're too high in the blood. The body can detect them and they can be actively transported from the blood and just put right into the filtrate. Anything that stays in the filtrate by the time it gets to the end of the collecting duct, that's now urine and that will drip into those little calyces to the renal pelvis and then will drip out into the ureter. Okay, number four, factors that influence um, filtration pressure. This is discussed in Chapter 25, Part A, PowerPoint, Script, Slides 57 to 64. There's um, different factors that will influence filtration rate. We call this glomerular filtration rate, or GFR. Okay, there is hydrostatic pressure in the blood that's pushing the, the material out from the bloodstream into the glomerular capsule. And it'll only be things that are small enough. If it's proteins or blood cells, they are not supposed to go through the filtration membrane. They stay in the bloodstream. Um, then you, but you also have kind of a back couple things that um, have the opposite effect at filtration rate. That would be the pressure in the glomerular capsule. If there's fluid already in that glomerular capsule, it creates kind of a back pressure. Okay, and that's called capsular hydrostatic pressure. Then you also have a pressure because in the blood you've got large proteins and blood cells and they draw water through osmosis and that's called osmotic pressure. So that will resist um, full filtration of all the water and solutes out from the bloodstream. And so what's left is called the net filtration pressure and that is discussed right here in chapter 25. This counter, number five, define the countercurrent mechanism. This is actually really important for conserving water. And in order to conserve water, the kidneys can um, concentrate the urine. Um, so but as the collecting tubules descend deeper and deeper into the kidney medulla, they are surrounded by tissue or interstitial fluid that's higher and higher in solute load. This is referred to as osmolality. So, because of the processes in the nephron, the countercurrent mechanism is actually due to the long loops of the nephron. When, when the de in the descending limb, water, water will be pulled out. Um, it's, it's freely permeable to water. So as that loop goes deep, deeper and deeper in the medulla, 
more and more water will be basically pulled out because the surrounding tissue is high in solute. When the filtrate goes back up, the ascending limb, sodium and, uh, is going to be actively transported out from the filtrate back into the body. So it's going to be actively um, reabsorbed. So sodium and then chloride will follow and other solutes are actively transported out from the ascending limb. So now you've got a smaller volume of filtrate. The filtrate enters the distal convoluted tubule and then to the collecting ducts. And that collecting duct or collecting tubule goes deep, deep, deep into the medulla. And if it's permeable, if there's aquaporins in it, the water can be sucked out. The only reason it would be permeable is um, is if you have antidiuretic hormone in the blood, okay? And this will be released, this hormone, ADH or antidiuretic hormone, is produced by the posterior pituitary in response to um, actually increased osmolality of the blood. That means there's a lot of uh, concentration of solutes in the blood. Basically, when you're dehydrated somewhat, blood pressure will drop, both of these things will stimulate the posterior pituitary to produce secrete ADH. It goes into the bloodstream, goes back to the kidneys, and it will insert these little aquaporins. That means if, if that is going to be real, the collecting tubule is really permeable to water, more and more water will be reabsorbed um, back into the kidney tissues and then, of course, back into the bloodstream to peritubular capillaries, into the capillaries in the kidney. So um, there are some really good figures that illustrate that in your um, PowerPoint scripts. Okay, the events uh, in the nephron that allow this countercurrent mechanism to produce concentrated loop, excuse me, to produce concentrated urine, this is happening in the loop of the nephron and that little video clip that I provided for you, the think Think Well video, please watch that. He explains it and illustrates it very well. Describe the role of ADH. Um, I just mentioned that earlier. ADH from posterior pituitary directly allows water, increases water reabsorption back into the body. Um, and that is going to, it acts on the collecting tubules and it will allow, it will make that collecting tubule very permeable and so that any water in the, ur in the filtrate can be sucked back into the body, resulting in a very small volume of urine that's highly concentrated. Now, if you have a big glass of fresh water, it'll inhibit ADH. So therefore, in the collecting tubule or the collecting duct, there won't be openings um, for uh, water to be pulled out. So therefore, the water stays in the filtrate, leading to a large volume of very... Um, dilute urine. Aldosterone is um, a hormone that will be released when blood pressure drops and it directly uh, will cause an increase in reabsorption of sodium from the, um, the, kid, from the tubules. Now, once sodium gets reabsorbed, water will follow due to osmosis. Aldosterone is produced by the adrenal cortex, and there is a pathway, and the pathway is described right here. Um, the baroreceptors, these detect pressure, okay? So if your blood pressure drops, that's actually considered a, an a, a emergency because blood, you, know, you lose blood or you lose body fluids, uh, even, you could die very quickly when you're losing blood pressure because there's not enough pressure to circulate the blood. Um, so baroreceptors detect changes in blood pressure and communicate this information both to posterior pituitary to signal ADH secretion that will, if, if blood pressure drops, it'll cause ADH secretion to increase. Um, and if, if blood pressure goes up, it'll inhibit ADH secretion. The other way that the, um, body that the baroreceptors will um, alert the body to changes in blood pressure and to correct that 
would be um, if blood pressure drops, it's going to signal the release of renin by the kidneys. And this is leading, this is actually referring to what we call that JGA, juxtaglomerular apparatus, sometimes referred to as the JGC, juxtaglomerular complex. It's a little location that's associated with the afferent arterial and um, the beginning of the distal convoluted tubule. But what it does, there, there's an area there that can detect blood pressure coming into the kidney through the afferent arterial. And then it will also be able to detect the, the sodium um, osmolality in the filtrate too. So there's a couple different ways that it'll detect if the body is becoming somewhat dehydrated, lost, um, and you need to reabsorb water. But first, you'll reabsorb sodium here. So the way this happens, blood pressure drops, it's going to signal the, the tissues in the kidney at the JGA to release renin. Renin then will activate the following pathway. Renin converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Then there's other enzymes actually angiotensin converting enzymes, which turns angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 targets the adrenal cortex, and the adrenal cortex, among other things, makes aldosterone. And aldosterone then will go to the kidneys tubules to increase sodium reabsorption by the kidney tubules, and that's going to lead to more water reabsorption. It's complicated. Okay, number nine. Mechanisms for regulation of water balance related to ADH and sodium balance related to aldosterone. All this is discussed in, in eight. Understand how blood pressure is related to urine formation. Little minor, little small changes in blood pressure are going to occur um, when you absorb water, absorb through the digestive tract. Okay, so that when, that's why with the kidneys, when we say reabsorbed, particularly with water, you, you absorbed it the first time uh, if you're, drink, you know, through ingestion. Um, so the blood pressure, if you're absorb, if you're taking water in through the gastrointestinal tract, um, it's actually going to cause the blood pressure to go up, and that is going to inhibit ADH. It'll inhibit. Uh, the release, it actually just will not cause renin to be released. So therefore, um, your blood pressure is higher. It's going to increase urine formation. Blood pressure drops due to all of these uh, events here. Blood pressure goes down. It's going to allow cause the kidneys to conserve urine so that the, the water will be reabsorbed, sodium is reabsorbed, leading to much smaller volume of highly concentrated urine. Okay, 11. This is the threats to acid base balance and how would the kidneys respond? Any kind of loss of body fluids is going to uh, result in not only loss of water but also electrolytes including uh, a hydrogen ion or bicarbonate. If a person is vomiting, they're losing hydrogen ion because of the acid in the stomach. If somebody has pro profound diarrhea, they're losing water, but they're also losing bicarbonate. So this could lead to an acid-base imbalance. Look at the diagrams um, in that there's a Word document in your module, and um, you can take a look at that those. And it shows you, um, I think one is the result of increasing water, um, and I'll show you those in just a second. The other one is showing um, an increase in sodium. But anyway, we'll take a look at those in just a second. The um, 12, describe the body's response to loss of body fluids during vomiting diarrhea. Uh, again, both of these are those diagrams, and I'll show you those. 13, other kidney functions. Just keep in mind the kidneys also produce some hormones. There is some other uh, drug metabolism. Some drugs are metabolized by the kidneys, but the hormones are going to be primarily renin, 
and erythropoietin. If you'll remember when we had the unit on blood, when the number of red blood cells drops, um, it's going to cause the release of erythropoietin or EPO from the kidneys, targets the bone marrow, which will increase the production of red blood cells. Renin, of course, is that hormone that will lead to ultimately the re increased reabsorption of sodium. Um, and there's a couple other minor things, but just remember these hormones are released by the kidneys. So what I'd like to do, I'm just going to minimize this, and then I'm going to show you those diagrams, and we will be um, finished with the study guide. I'm not sure what's, there we go. All right. Um, This is cardiovascular. This thing's a little bit slow. Oh, here we go. Oh. Here's that think while kidney function video. It's really good. Please watch that. It's a little bit different way of looking at it. And right here, the diagrams for the urinary system. Uh, you could print these out and keep them with you, particularly since we will have some questions on the open note final exam as well. And so, oh, here we go. Okay, this is a kind of a slow computer. And this shows you both, it's a two-page thing. This is results of increased intake of water. This is the results of decreased body sodium. So these arrows are showing an increase and these arrows leading to. So an increased water intake is gonna to lead to an increased plasma volume. This will in lead to an increased atrial volume leading to a firing of baroreceptors, which are pressure receptors. This is going to inhibit or decreases hypothalamic ADH, neurosecretory cells activity. We haven't gotten to endocrine yet, but posterior pituitary is actually, they're actually neurons of the hypothalamus. But remember, this is essentially the posterior pituitary. Okay. So when the blood pressure is up, plasma volume is up, it leads to decreased release of ADH. Here it is, decreased ADH secretion, increasing the amount of water excreted. If you wanted to think of the results of decreased intake of water, the, all of these arrows would be the other way. Decreased volume, plasma volume leads to decreased atrial volume, and it's actually going to lead to uh, baroreceptors firing, telling the body that, hey, blood pressure is dropping. This is going to lead to increased hypothalamic ADH um, neurosecretory cells activity leading to increased ADH secretion leading to decreased water excreted. Okay, the water gets reabsorbed instead. Here's decreased body sodium. Decreased body sodium leads to decreased plasma volume leading to decreased venous volume and pressure leading to decreased atrial volume and pressure. These arrows are kind of teeny, but you can see it on a larger page better. This is going to lead to decreased ventricular volume and pressure, decreased cardiac output, decreased renal arterial blood pressure, renal baroreceptors are going to fire. And this is actually, and also it's going to activate the sympathetic nervous system. This is going to lead to a renin secretion, and that is an arrow going up. Um, increased renin is eventually going to lead to increased aldosterone through that angiotensinogen, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2 pathway. Increased aldosterone secretion leads to increased tubular sodium reabsorption, which results in decreased sodium excretion. Again, if you have increased uh, body sodium, the opposite, all these arrows over to the left would be the opposite direction. And I think that's about it. Have a wonderful day. I will see you on Monday. Bye-bye.